Now, without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Ryder, who is a psychologist and philosopher who in the 1970s invented the word speciesism. Uh, Dr. Ryder has contributed to groundbreaking books on animal rights and animal experimentation. He has acted as chairman for the RSPCA. He was president of the Liberal Democrats Animal Welfare Group, and he founded Eurogroup, which is the principal coordinating and lobbying organization for animals in the European community. He has also contributed significantly to some of the major legislative changes on animals, uh, animal issues that we've seen in this country. And more recently, he's known for his work um, on painism, his theory of painism. Today, he's going to be giving a presentation uh, about campaigning. So we're going to hear the presentation, and then there'll be some time for discussion <coughs> and questions. Okay, so I'll hand over to Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel extremely honoured to be invited to make the opening address and I'd like to congratulate Jessica on organising what's clearly a groundbreaking conference. She mentioned the, one of the themes that seems to be emerging is this dual aspect of our subject, the academic on one side and the applied or political on the other. And she mentioned hybrids, mixtures of both worlds. And I think I'm probably one of those. She's asked me to talk about campaigning, campaigning techniques. Uh, by campaigning, I refer to any organized series of actions aimed to gain support for or to build up opposition to certain practices. The campaign seeks change. Usually, it seeks change at the root of a problem and not at its edges. There are two further common features of a campaign. First, a campaign often aims to prevent something bad from happening in the future, rather than picking up the pieces after it has happened. <coughs> Secondly, it usually seeks general change and not just change for a particular case. In the words of the metaphor, a campaign aims to provide a fence at the top of the cliff, not an ambulance at the bottom. <laughs> so how can we campaign for animals in the 21st century? I was fortunate to be in at the beginning of the modern animal protection movement, an extraordinary period that has stretched in the UK from the mid-1960s until about the year 2006. It was four decades of remarkable achievement in which huge changes have been gained, not only in attitudes, but in laws and regulations, both nationally and internationally. Being in this privileged position, I could observe what techniques were effective in animal uh, protection terms and what were not. The modern animal rights movement began, incidentally, in Britain and not in the USA. <clears throat> in this paper, I'll try to outline uh, some of my conclusions. So how do we start a campaign? There are, I, I would suggest, five useful steps. One, targets. Two, publicity. Three, focusing public, public opinion. Four, meeting the decision makers. Five, follow up. So the first one is the need for clear cut targets. These clear cut targets must be concisely expressed. For example, ban cosmetics testing, stop live exports, or save the seals were all effective. Slogans are useful for several reasons. They immediately identify the issue they unite like-minded people, and they tell those in positions of influence what they have to do. Such slogans work especially well in public in order to enlist new support and to motivate existing supporters. In private, however, far more specific and concrete targets may be required. When negotiating with a government minister or a company CEO, you have to speak their language. So it's amend section three of the 19... 76 Act, or delete Exemption 2 of Regulation 5, or repeal the 1934, etc. These are fictitious examples, but are given to illustrate the need for good campaigners to know exactly what it is they want. Campaigners must give chapter and verse. You must be able to state exactly what it is you want to achieve. The second step is that most campaigns need initial publicity. A brief analysis of some of the successful animal campaigns of the 1970s and 1980s 
reveals that they all started with high level, high profile and emotive publicity. And pictures, of course, work better than words. When human beings actually see pictures or film of animals suffering, about 70% react strongly and positively in support of the animals. Thank God. So publish the pictures. There are two chief ways to manufacture publicity. You either have to pay for advertising or you have to create your own news stories. The first is paying for advertising. <clears throat> Gavin Grant's 1989 RSPCA pile of dead dogs advert actually rocked the Thatcher government. It nearly brought it down. And Brian Davis's 1990 full page blood bespattered anti-hunting adverts started off the successful modern campaign to outlaw hunting with dogs. David Blaine's 1985 anti-fur TV commercial, Dumb Animals, made for Mark Glover of Lynx, was similarly brilliant. What was it that these three examples have in common? The answer is that they were all shocking. The second way to generate publicity is by making your own news stories. Although, incidentally, if you have successful enough of advertising, it itself can become a news story. So you get it both ways. So with all those three examples I discussed became controversial in themselves and were discussed by the media. So one led on to the other. But sometimes you just have to generate a news story, as it were, starting from scratch. This is harder, but less expensive. I may say less expensive because, of course, those examples I gave were the creations of top advertising um, agencies like Abbott, Mead, Vickers, and Bogle, Bartle, and Hegarty. Okay, usually it needs inside investigations and photos to create a news story. The Sunday People's photos of the smoking beagles way back in 1975 is a case in point. At our suggestion, the newspaper infiltrated their reporters into the ICI laboratories in Alderley Edge. They took jobs as laboratory technicians. In the USA, there were Henry Sparrow's infiltration of a New York museum where sex experiments on cats were being conducted. And then came the two shocking stories of the Silver Spring monkeys and the hammering of the heads of conscious primates. Brave whistleblowers and infiltrators got pictures of these atrocities. In Britain, we saw film footage of cruelty to elephants in circuses, cruelty in slaughterhouses, cruelty to rabbits in experiments, cruelty to seals and cruelty to whales. All these involved photographs or film obtained dangerously by courageous infiltrators but without any violence or risk to the lives of the animal abusers themselves. Let me just say this clearly at this stage. Nothing is to be gained by violence to the abusers. The media will immediately turn it against the campaign. It's also highly morally questionable to cause suffering in order to stop suffering. So violence, violence is to be avoided at all costs. There are, however, various relatively non-violent ways to create news stories, such as A, shocking or emotive pictures, as I've already said. Secondly, the use of celebrities. Third, tying the story to some other newsworthy events. Timing can be important here. Fourth, wrapping it up in something funny or novel, doing a stunt. And finally, creating an event such as a demonstration, a conference, or by publishing a report. All these are media-worthy pegs on which stories can be hung. Now, good relations with the media count for a lot. The media need news stories as a car needs fuel. So establish good personal relationships with journalists and reporters. Some will be genuinely interested in animal welfare and some will not. But all need good copy. So work with them, meet them, lunch with them, Convince them that you are a reliable source of accurate information. Sometimes they will let you down, or their editors will. They may turn against you. They may twist a good story or fail to publish it. This doesn't matter. You must expect this. The important thing is that sometimes they will publicize cruelty to animals, and that is what you want. So collaborate with the journalists in creating good stories. Remember, we're at a huge advantage here because Animals are a highly desirable media issue. We're not trying to promote saucepans or toilet paper or insurance, but animals. 
So we start with an advantage. Remember also that publicity is the universal lubricant when a campaign gets stuck. However good the negotiators are on the inside of the tent, it can often help them if those on the outside start banging drums. The third step is to rise public opinion and focus it onto the decision makers. Most campaigns benefit from having public opinion on their side. So rouse it. Rouse it by publicity, letters, emails, twitters, Facebooks, blogs, etc. When you've roused it, measure it professionally. You can then truthfully say 70% or whatever of the public or of the electorate are on our side. This can make a great impression on those who can change things, especially on politicians. Then ask your supporters to bombard supermarkets, governments, politicians, etc. with demands to do what you want them to do using emails, telephone calls, letters, etc. That is really the fourth step to arrange to meet the decision makers. Make sure, as I've already said, that you know exactly what it is you want and that you are meeting the people who actually have the power to deliver it. The golden rule is to contact the people with the real power. It's still a question of who you know as much as what you know. So don't waste too much time with backbench MPs if it's the government you should be meeting. Don't pressurize laboratory researchers if it's the Home Office who can actually change things. Get your targets right. In Britain, ordinary MPs can help a little, but not very much. Parliamentary questions, early day motions, and debates can be helpful, of course, but not sufficient. You should be meeting ministers, or their officials, or their special advisors. Outside the UK, you should meet commissioners, directors general of the great quangos, as well, of course, as presidents. When you meet them, present your case correctly. In fact, there are only about six types of evidence that impress those in power. First, evidence of the cruelty itself, pictures included. Secondly, scientific evidence. So commission the right scientific research. Thirdly, public opinion. So use the evidence of opinion polls showing how much support you have. Fourthly, legal opinions. So employ top lawyers with big names if you can afford them. Fifthly, economic advice. Use economists for this. And finally, evidence of cruelty-free alternatives that don't use animals cruelly, like, for example, tissue cultures for laboratory testing. Always look for an alternative. Now, the fifth and final step is always say thank you when you get a result. But even so, keep checking that the results are being enforced. After crucial meetings, write summaries of the progress that has been agreed and send copies to those with whom you've been negotiating so that they can't forget. Note, first of all, that not all campaigns need to have a high profile. Some campaigns can take place behind the scenes in the corridors of power and produce excellent results. Even a single telephone call can sometimes produce results, or a series of private meetings over dinner. Examples are my telephone call to the head of a shipping company, which resulted in his stopping the live exports of calves for six months. That only took about half an hour. Another is, is, is from a friend of mine who met a dictator over dinner, who outlawed overnight the eating of dogs in that part of the world. He wanted to attach capital punishment to this, but uh, my friend had to sort of take it down. It all shows that when you actually engage the attention of the right people, you can get results. All these, of course, were already in a context of support. So try your usual context. Work on the inside as much as you can. The second point to note is that campaigns should be both reactive and proactive. Campaigning is not just a matter of reacting to events. As we've just explained, brand new issues can be launched out of the blue and new news stories created overnight. Often one hears the question, should we be reacting to events or should we be proactively creating new ones? Clearly it's not a question of either or. 
good campaigners should be doing both. <clears throat> when I was heading the political animal lobby, PAL, I would scan the media every day and frequently would find a news story involving animals to which I could respond productively, either by issuing a press release or telephoning a friendly journalist or writing a letter to a government minister or doing something to pursue PAL's animal welfare objectives. Even bad events are opportunities to get your message across. They should never be missed. They are all bandwagons onto which one should jump in order to steer them in the direction of animal welfare. Let's just consider a few old, very old examples of successful campaigns that achieved good results in the past. They all follow approximately the five steps I've just suggested. One, clear-cut targets. Two, initial publicity. Three, the rising and focusing of public opinion onto the decision makers. Fourthly, meeting those decision makers. And finally, thanks and follow-up. The first example I give is the Scottish seal cull in 1978 that was called off after a provocative publicity created by Greenpeace that confronted the foreign marksmen with their boat. Secondly, Brian Davis's huge advertisements in the national press showing seals and urging readers to write to the Prime Minister. Mr. Callaghan received a record 17,000 letters in a week. That was a, a record for any subject on any issue. And C, um, my face-to-face -face RSPCA meetings with the Secretary of State, providing him with a scientific face saver. And, uh, thanks to Bill Jordan, actually, we produced evidence showing that nobody knew for certain how much fish the seals were actually eating. And that gave the government the excuse to stop the whole thing. A second example was the smoking beagles that I've already referred to in 1975. We got a ban on smoking beagles after undercover journalists directed by campaigners generated shocking publicity, that's to say photographs of beagle dogs being forced to smoke in research laboratories. Secondly, a tour of the country urging the public to write letters to their MPs. It was the, in the days before emails, it, it was very simple, you just had to write a letter. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, face-to-face -face meetings with the Home Secretary, Mr. Carr, and after that he stopped it all further smoking experiments on dogs in Britain. Thirdly, uh, another um, example is the import ban on baby seal skins in 1983. Uh, this was an e EU ban. This was achieved after several years of shocking publicity of the Canadian seal slaughter on television and so on. Cooperation between I4 and the RSPCA and other groups. A scientific report from the RSPCA into its cruelty Visits to Canada by uh, RSPCA-sponsored celebrities, uh, principally Richard Adams. Uh, Letter-writing campaigns to MEPs and meetings with EU officials. Mass demonstrations in London, Brussels and Strasbourg um, that finally caused um, movement. This was one of the occasions I find myself standing on the plinth of Nelson's column addressing a crowd of several thousand. And later in Brussels, doing the same thing sharing the platform with Brigitte Bardot, which was very interesting. <laughs> Fourthly, another example, the UK Act and EU Directive on Animal Experimentation of 1986 followed, one, much publicity about cruel experiments from about 1970, a book that helped provoke parliamentary debates and EDMs and television, formation of a group of scientists and politicians for reform that was called Cray, uh, chaired by Douglas Hyten, meetings with Home Secretaries calling for Cray's detailed reforms. We met both Willie Whitelaw and Merlin Rees. Um, successful lobbying for pledges in the election manifestos. We persuaded Mrs. Thatcher to agree in 1979 to modernise the law. And contact with EU officials like Stanley Johnson, which also led to the directive of the same year. Basically, you can see they're all following the same pattern. The final example I'd give you is the ban on otter hunting in 1977. Uh, first of all, peaceful but funny protests at hunt meetings in order to generate publicity. We got photographs in front of national newspapers. Um, cooperation with the conservationists, so we didn't fight them. We seemed to be speaking with one voice. <clears throat> Serious articles placed in scientific newspapers after planning with friendly journalists. 
uh, contact with MPs and ministers, and presentation of combined scientific, economic, and legal evidence with evidence from polls of public opinion. As I've said, in general, it pays to have the reputation for being able to create embarrassing publicity against animal abusers, governments, breeders, hunters, transporters, laboratories, trappers, etc. Don't forget President Teddy Roosevelt's campaigning motto, talk quietly, but carry a big stick. The big stick, the big stick in our case, is usually publicity. Right, here are some conclusions then. <clears throat> These examples all illustrate the principles I've listed. Campaigning requires a lot of hard work and one must be prepared to persist long enough to get results. You can spend months bringing pressure to bear with any sign of progress and then one more little shove and hey presto, resistance suddenly collapses. Campaigns vary hugely in length. Sometimes, as I've said, you can get a result after one persuasive phone call. Other campaigns drag on for years. The modern campaign to reform the UK law on animal experimentation started in 1970, for example, and only achieved new legislation in 1986, 16 years. The modern campaign to stop hunting with dogs was started by Brown Davis in 1990 and only reached fruition with the Hunting Act of 2004, 14 years. Of course, ineffectual campaigning had been going on since the 1880s. I mentioned Brown Davis. He's been the person from whom I've learned most about campaigning. Brown moved calmly and creatively. He cut himself free from bureaucracy. He always went direct to the top. So he met presidents, prime ministers, and chief executives. He would make friends with them. How did he gain access? Sometimes by offering good publicity and public support to these figures. Sometimes he did it with donations to election funds or party coffers. For six years, I was director of the political animal lobby, which Brian and I created in 1990, and we made large but legal donations to each of the main political parties in the UK. Subsequently, Brian and I met all the party leaders, Prime Ministers John Major and Tony Blair, as well as Paddy Ashdown and Neil Kinnock. We discussed animal welfare and what we wanted, both with them and their personal assistance. Once you've met the man at the top, the important thing is to get him to uh, put you in touch with one of his um, officials. The official knowing that it's coming from the top will take, your, take what you have to say seriously. So we met with um, special advisors and chiefs of staff, uh, for example, Jonathan Powell, Peter Mandelson, and the young George Osborne, believe it or not. You should always try to work on the inside, but you must never lose touch with your own grassroots or with the power of public opinion, which you can mobilize on the outside. I've campaigned throughout Europe, in Washington and in Canberra, Australia, and have found that the basic principles are the same all over the world. In developing countries, which lack elaborate constitutional structures, progress can sometimes be easier, provided you meet the right people. Of course, there were many other great campaigners in the Golden Age beside Brian. I'll mention only some of those who've now retired or died. Clive Hollands, Douglas Houghton, Dave Wetton, Joyce De Silva, and Peter Stevenson are shining British examples, each specializing in their own fields. My old friend Kim Stallwood has been a pioneer both as a campaigner and as a publicist. In America, there were the elegant Christine Stevens and the dynamic Henry Spira, and later Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco. Since then, and still active, are many, many others. As I've said, violent extremists have pr proved counterproductive. The media giving them short shrift and the whole movement becoming tarred with the same brush. There are several people in this room who will be able to make comments on, on this and, and have been involved themselves. And um, I'd be very interested in hearing their, their comments later. Mark Gold is prominent among them. Um, since the great controversy over hunting with dogs, the opposition has worked hard to get the media onto its side, sometimes persuading agencies to change their allegiances or seducing individuals to do so, and often exaggerating the support they have. Insulting accusations of terrorism have been circulated against all animal welfareists indiscriminately. In the earlier days, there was a tendency for the organizations to compete counterproductively. Hollands, Houghton, and myself instigated 
a movement to bring the campaigning groups together in joint action committees uh, in the 1970s, Cray, Force, Jacobus, and GCAP, which made us more effective. We started the attendances at party conferences and revived political lobbying generally and promoted the use of scientific and other high-grade data. In 1978, I persuaded the RSPC to set up Eurogroup for Animal Welfare in Brussels, which has had so much success, not due to me, and runs along similar lines, bringing all the EU countries together, lobbying the Commission, the Council, and the EU Parliament. <clears throat> the recent successful campaign against hunting also illustrates the effectiveness of organisations working together. From the early 1990s, we formed a working group of the RSPCA, the League Against Cruel Sports, and IFOR. For the record, it was Douglas Batcher at the League who performed so well in fronting that campaign. The RSPCA's role was to organise backbench support for reform, and this too turned out actually to be quite important when faced with a vacillating Tony Blair. <coughs> Powell played a behind-the-scenes role in commissioning research, influencing the party machines, funding party animal welfare researchers, and supplying our own high-grade technical evidence on economics, pain, conservation, opinion surveys, and even ethics direct to Downing Street. I mentioned ethics. It's, in fact, helped the modern animal welfare movement very much that the whole issue has been underpinned by huge international support from first-rank philosophers such as Professor Tom Regan, who gave academic credibility to the theory of animal rights, using rights theory approach, Professor Andrew Lindsay, who supplied the theology, and Professor Peter Singer, who championed animal liberation on utilitarian principles. The ethical revival started in Oxford in about 1970, for example, with my theory of speciesism and the groundbreaking book by the Goldoviches and John Harris, entitled Animals, Men and Morals, and then five or ten years later, spreading to the USA, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Europe, and the rest of the world. Gradually, the human race is beginning to realize that the other animals are simply our evolutionary cousins. They suffer just as we do. Speciesism is a prejudice no better than racism or sexism. A good, strong ethical argument always helps, but is, sadly, never sufficient on its own. Of course, as a psychologist, I'm aware that some people make better campaigners than others. Intelligence, commitment, and drive obviously are important. Persistence also. A couple of years ago, I listed 21 skills and personality traits that I thought are important in campaigning. Most of these are being able to use the various techniques and tools available. Much can be achieved still by strength of personality, charm, and sheer drive. Our, success, our successes have been remarkable. Besides huge changes in attitude, we've created five new laws in the UK, 12 in the EU, and many elsewhere in the world, including a new anti-cruelty law now being planned in China. The movement has worked because it has ranged across the board from those prepared to pr protest in the streets to those who passed resolutions in respectable institutes, from frankly emotional outbursts to the cool and sophisticated findings of science and law. The movement has been successful because it has encompassed such a wide cross-section of the community. Campaigning, of course, can be fun. I remember campaigning in Scandinavia when the icicles hanging off the gutters were five foot long, meeting the baby harp seals in Canada, and speaking on the steps of a 50 foot high statue of Lenin, surrounded by six beautiful Russian models wearing only body makeup. That actually was in the summer, not in the winter. <laughs> Somewhere in what had been the old Soviet Union, I addressed an audience of 500 young veterinary students about the need for animal rights, and was amazed when the three granite-faced professors, all Brezhnev look-alikes, <laughs> solemnly agreed with me. I was not used to getting the support of elderly veterinarians. I certainly never got it in Britain. When I mentioned my surprise to my host afterwards, a local animal-minded oligarch, he merely murmured, well, I pay them. <laughs> so that's the other way of doing it, another way of doing it. <laughs> Since about the year 2006, the movement in Europe and the UK seems to have slowed a little. Three important UK laws passed in the present century were in fact planned and lobbied for in the 1990s. 
the ban on fur farming, which came into effect in 2000, the Hunting Act of 2004, and the Animal Welfare Act of 2006, announced, incidentally, by Elliot Morley when he opened the RSPCA's headquarters in 2001. For the record, the innovative duty of care provision in this Act, which is Section 9, was proposed by Mick Flower of the RSPCA and is having a very considerable effect, not only in this country, but around the world, because other people copy what the British do uh, when it comes to legislation and so on. While the redefined cruelty offence, Section 4, followed proposals from, from David Thomas, and to a lesser extent myself, Maybe the time will come when young people with the energy of youth will reawaken the movement. So much is ex accepted now that was ridiculed in 1970. Animal welfare is now widely agreed to be a serious and worthwhile scientific, political and moral issue. As a successful political movement, it deserves more serious academic study to support that begun by Robert Garner. Hopefully, after the current world recession is over, we can begin to move forward again after a few years of unwanted stagnation. In an increasingly global planet, animals need protection all over the world, and I look forward to the day when there will be a convention on animal rights at the United Nations, and when X amount of pain in a dog or a cow will be given the same amount of moral and legal importance as X amount of pain in a human being. We need a new beginning, and this conference could be the beginnings of this new beginning. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ryder for a very thought-provoking and informative keynote speech. We'll now take questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Hello, yes. Yeah, what does Dr. Ryder think of um, Tony Blair's um, hints in his biography about telling Hazel Blair's to um, advise the Association of Chief Police Officers not to bother the um, police, the uh, Hunting Act? That's how I read it anyway. Sorry, if I got it wrong. Well, Tony Blair produces a number of very strange statements in his memorandum, doesn't it? In his um, memoirs. Uh, one was he says, I can't think why I ever went along with the idea to ban fox hunting. Well, he knew jolly well that the Labour Party just received a donation from IFOR of a million pounds. And he seems to have forgotten that. Um, I mean, it is sorry to say that there are some politicians who work, it seems, entirely cynically. Um, and uh, he wanted to please all sides. He wanted to please the, the, um, um, uh, the Queen and uh, one or two other people he hints at didn't like the idea of ban on hunting. So he, he, he tries to make out now that he was always against it. And I suppose I have to be fair to him. To an extent, he was. After, um, it, it was, it was, it was uh, Jonathan Powell, actually, his chief of staff, who seemed to be quite keen on getting some legislation to stop hunting. Jonathan Powell deserves a lot of credit for all sorts of things. He was a very outstanding chief of staff, always kept a low profile, but uh, very often was seen to be running the country when Blair was out swanning around hitting the headlines. And uh, um, Powell was, was always sympathetic to getting some legislation through. But it very at the end, it came to a battle between the um, uh, between what Blair wanted, when he wanted, tried to stop it, really. And uh, it was only because we managed to mobilize uh, large numbers of backbenchers from his own party, uh, who brought such pressure to bear upon him that he had to go along with it. Are there any other questions at all? Hello, yes. Isn't it uh, colluding in corruption to be bribing politicians with million pound donations? I mean, how does that square ethically with the cause? Well, um, we gave donations to all the political parties. I think it's quite wrong that any money should be given to any political party by anybody. But you have to deal with the situation as it is. It's, it is extraordinary that the, the great so-called democracies still allow individuals to give money to their parties. And I can tell you that the policies of the world are determined by people who are giving money to parties particularly in America, but also in this country. And uh, 
it is extraordinary that, that when politicians address this issue at all, they merely talk about putting a ceiling on the amount of money you can give, £100,000 and no more or something. Well, that's not sufficient. There shouldn't be any giving of money to political parties. Brian Davis and I agreed this right at the beginning. We thought it was scandalous that as this was the situation, legally, and other people were doing it, we started to do it. And it was very sad that um, there were some, many politicians who were genuinely interested in animal welfare. There's no doubt about that. But there were another group of politicians who only started showing serious interest when it was known that you carried a checkbook. Yeah, I mean, people don't talk about this because the people who give money don't like it to be known, usually, that money is being given. And very often they're giving money for ulterior motives. They want their, their knighthood, or they want their OBE, uh, or they want some benefit for their own business. We weren't looking for benefits to our business. We were just looking for benefits to the animals. So we, we, we don't really see the reason for keeping quiet about it. It's made perfectly obvious. It's quite interesting, the fact that it, it got out that the um, political animal lobby had given a donation of a million pounds to the Labour Party. And the Conservatives used this, and the pro-hunting people used this endlessly. And there was a debate in the House of Lords on the hunting issue a few years ago, which I attended. And um, um, I can't remember his name for a moment, the, the, the Labour peer who was, who was um, trying to defend the government's attitude. And all the backbenching, backbench, not backbench, all the, the Conservative peers who were pro-hunting <coughs> kept on referring to this huge donation from the political animal lobby. So I slipped a note to the Labour peer saying, nobody seems to realise that we also gave a three-figure sum to the Conservative Party. And he made a very good speech. I didn't know whether he'd use this, because I'd never met him. And he made a very good speech, ended up by saying, and what is more, I understand that the Conservative Party also received a three-figure, uh, sorry, a six-figure sum, a six-figure sum um, from the political animal lobby. And there was dead silence. <laughs> and you could have heard a pin drop, and they never said another word. The, 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 the debate just stopped there. And you'll see that in Hansard. I mean, they simply didn't realize that we were giving money to all the parties, and we, were, we, were, we weren't attaching many strings to them. We were just saying we hoped they would address the issue of animal welfare generally more efficiently than they were doing hitherto. And we suggested that some of the money we were giving to them should be used to set up research departments within the party machines to research the science and politics and economics of animal welfare, which is what they all did up to a point, although the Conservatives did it a little bit less than the other two parties. But the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party for a period of two or three years in the 1990s were actually running very efficient research um, uh, enterprises into animal welfare itself as an issue. Do we have any more questions, please? Yes, at the back. Yeah. Um, you've been talking about a particular form of, of activism and of campaigning, which is uh, the one that aims to enter getting some legal change or some change in policy making. And um, I think that's fine. But uh, something that worries me when I, when I look at, for instance, how people think of the movement, how, how people think that the movement has been doing so far, they tend to focus very much on this, on this kind of changes. And uh, social change uh, takes place in many different forms. And uh, I personally think that the, the most uh, significant achievement that a movement has uh, uh, attained thus far is actually the number of vegans out of, out of anti-species people that they are. So I just wanted to express this concern because, uh, you know, from your presentation, uh, some people could get the impression that it's all about this legal change and all that. Yes, I, 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 I agree. You can use other criteria. Um, and um, attitude change is a, a subject mm -hmm. of its own right. I think probably what has happened is that the animal welfare organizations have sought to make concrete changes, things that you can really see make a difference, rather than attitude change. Attitude change is such a nebulous thing. And unless you're going to spend quite a lot of money 
measuring it professionally, you don't really know um, how much has changed. I mean, the only evidence we have for uh, attitude change, which is scientific, is the sort of opinion polling that's gone on over the years. Um, and there, of course, you have to be very careful because unless if you change the wording, you know, you could easily get different answers that could be misleading. So there's all sorts of tech methodological problems of measuring attitude change that you probably know a lot more about than I do. I, I agree with you, certainly. Um, the number of people saying that they're vegetarians and vegans are, are some of the criteria that one might, one might use. We can take two more questions from the audience, please, at the back. Um, could you tell them why you said that um, ethical arguments alone are not enough? Yes, yes. Why, on, why, are, why did I say that ethical arguments are not enough? Well, um, if I was an animal, I wouldn't be worried whether a, a, a lot of people were using persuasive ethical arguments or not. I'd be worried about the way in which I was actually treated. And when you're dealing with people who've got a clear vested interest in exploiting animals in a particular way, whether it's the fur industry or farming or uh, animal experiments or whatever it is, um, they need more than ethical arguments to change their ways, usually. They're usually in an entrenched, in an entrenched position where they've uh, established uh, a source of income for themselves, a livelihood, their well-established habits of behavior. In order to change that, you need more, very often, than ethical arguments. So we have time for one final question, please. Um, the lady at the front in the pink t-shirt, thank um, you. So, uh, what's wrong with violence towards an animal abuser if you can get away with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about ethics, I and mean, I think there is an ethical argument here. Um, and, and if you're going to cause violence, you're going to cause suffering. And what we're against is suffering. So there is a paradox, a, a, a prima facie paradox to an extent that. Um, also, as I said, on the practical political level, um, you've got a media who will immediately pounce upon you and discredit your movement in the eyes of but the majority. You could get away with it. the media. Oh. Who do the media for doing so. so. Well, I didn't. I mean, yeah, but if it's known about it, um, the media will, will, will seize upon it. You could say quite rightly, depending on what your moral position is. But all the. Um, Major philo ph philosophers involved, I think, have, have, have and Peter Singer and Tom Regan and others have all made it clear that disapproval of the use of violence. We follow more Gandhi's approach of non violence, which, of course, Gandhi, very interestingly, as you know, was very much uh, uh, committed to the idea of animal rights, an idea which he got uh, again from the, from, from the British, from Henry Salt and George Bernard Shaw. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together one more time for Dr. Richard Ryan?